Hello, my name is Whitney Horning and I am here today because I asked a question and received an answer. So maybe, Adrienne, we want to be careful what answers we, or what questions we ask. You'll end up being here someday. On June 27, 1844, Joseph Smith Jr., an authentic religious genius, was murdered in cold blood before the work of the restoration was completed. Joseph's ministry began during his 15th year when in faith, he rose up out of the darkness and chaos of this world and into the light of Christ. He willingly chose to serve his God, laboring and sacrificing much to restore the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ to a hard-hearted and stiff-necked generation. In fulfillment of prophecy, the world has long spoken both good and evil of Joseph Smith. Many people in many churches claim that they know him. Historians, theologians, authors, and scholars have produced an exhaustive number of volumes on the subject. The majority of these works are based upon the historical narrative put forth by the largest and most well-known branch of Joseph's restoration, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. They assert that Joseph was commanded by God to enter into plural marriage using a priesthood ordinance called sealing, secretly teaching the doctrine to a select group of men and women in Nauvoo. The LDS Church bases their claims upon the lies of John C. Bennett, the polygamy of Brigham Young and his followers, and the revelation on marriage known as LDS Doctrine and Covenants, section 132. On April 6, 1860, Joseph Smith III, the oldest living son of Joseph and Emma, established the second largest branch founded upon the Restoration, the Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Joseph III spent his life exonerating his father from the accusation of plural marriage and was instrumental in persuading the United States Congress to pass stricter laws prohibiting the practice of polygamy. For over 100 years, the RLDS Church believed and taught that Joseph Smith was a faithful and honorable monogamist. In 1918, RLDS Patriarch Albert A. Smith, grandson of Joseph and Emma, made the observation that the LDS Church in Utah included two remarkable statements in their official history. The first was made by Joseph in May of 1844 and stated, what a thing it is for a man to be accused of committing adultery and having seven wives when I can find only one. The second was stated 10 days before he died. I have taught all the strong doctrines publicly and always taught stronger doctrines in public than in private. Patriarch Smith concluded that these two statements effectually disposes of the Utah claim that Joseph taught the strong and rank doctrine of polygamy in private, not daring to teach it in public. Salt Lake can hardly repudiate its own version of these sermons. There is no halfway ground. Either Joseph Smith was true and clean, open and above board, or else he was a hypocrite and a fraud through and through. The Utah Mormons cannot long continue seriously to contend that he was a real prophet of God and a good man, yet blowing hot in private and cold in public, a monogamist in the pulpit and press, and a polygamist in his home, a pure milk of the word man by daylight, and a strong meat man after dark. In 2001, the RLDS Church officially changed their name to the community of Christ. Because the historical preponderance of the LDS Church regarding Joseph and polygamy is widely accepted as fact today, the Community of Christ Church has now begun to sway toward believing the LDS Church's portrayal of Joseph. Several years ago, as an active, faithful, seventh-generation Latter-day Saint, I concluded that my church's position on Joseph and polygamy showed him to be the worst kind of hypocrite. Yet I could not deny that his words filled me with light and a hunger to know the Lord. 
I became determined to reconcile this paradox and find the truth. I researched, studied, pondered, and prayed for a process of time. One day, a quiet thought entered my mind. What if Joseph meant what he said? What if he was telling the truth? As I opened my mind to this new and intriguing idea, I began to come to know the real Joseph. He was a brilliant theologian. He was never one to back down or hesitate to proclaim all of the doctrines of the gospel, regardless of the persecution and opposition he encountered. He was a a religious revolutionary who shared deep and often poignant thoughts and feelings on a number of difficult to understand topics without apology. But on the subject of plural marriage, whenever he spoke about it, he emphatically denounced it and condemned it. Whenever God begins a work to renew and restore truth, there is always opposition in order to preserve our right to choose. Opposition presents itself in a myriad of ways. One of those is through the false spirit of adultery. Because adulterous hearts require signs to believe, the introduction of sexual promiscuity into a restoration is one of the easiest ways for Satan to derail it. In the Eastern United States, there were other new religious groups that arose around the same time that Joseph began the restoration. Some of these new religions espoused divergent sexual and marital practices, such that polygamy began to be associated with all religious reform. The adversaries seemed aware that Joseph was destined to prove a disturber and an annoyer of his kingdom, and thus oppression and persecution arose against him almost from his infancy. He was often accused of adultery and polygamy, and it quickly became a commonplace for Mormon missionaries to be asked if they believed in having more wives than one. In 1834, Joseph was a member of a committee organized to publish a work arranged from the items of the doctrine of Christ and titled The Doctrine and Covenants. Published in 1835 and unanimously accepted by the saints, it contained a section which became known as the Statement or Law of the Church on Marriage. It stated in part, as this Church of Christ has been reproached with the crime of fornication and polygamy, we declare that we believe that one man should have one wife and one woman but one husband, except in case of death when either is at liberty to marry again. By 1842, Dr. John C. Bennett's sexual escapades in Nauvoo added fuel to the ongoing adultery rumors, this time adding a new twist that Joseph was secretly preaching and practicing polygamy and giving Bennett and other select men permission to do likewise. When Joseph discovered Bennett's sexual indiscretions and his duplicity, he confronted him. Doctor, why are you using my name to carry on your hellish wickedness? Have I ever taught you that fornication and adultery was right, or polygamy, or any such practice? Did I ever teach you anything that was not virtuous, that was iniquitous, either in public or private? Bennett responded, you never did, and then swore out an affidavit affirming that Joseph had only taught the strictest principles of the gospel and of virtue both in public and in private. Bennett was excommunicated for his misconduct, yet this did not stop the cancer of secret abominations from spreading throughout Nauvoo and the church. As Joseph and Emma began to understand just how deeply the putridity of Bennett's behavior and teachings had seeped into the minds of the saints, they determined that since adultery takes two willing participants, that the women of the church would benefit from their own instruction. 
a society for the females where they could meet regularly to learn truth straight from Joseph and Emma's mouths. It was organized on March 17, 1842. The primary purpose of the Female Relief Society was to strengthen and promote virtue and chastity among the women. Joseph and Emma soon realized that the women of the church had become so dependent upon the prophet and other leading men that they were susceptible to evil persuasion by any who claimed Joseph said it is right. Joseph encouraged the women to learn the scriptures and think for themselves, stating that if the people departed from the Lord, they must fall, that they were depending on the prophet, hence they were darkened in their minds from neglect of themselves. Joseph did not want the women to trust in the arm of flesh, specifically men's adulterous advances. He and Emma hoped that a closer connection to her would empower women to just say no when approached by men making false claims. Joseph asked Emma to tell the sisters of the society that if any man, no matter who he was, undertook to talk such stuff as the doctrine of polygamy to them in their houses, just order him out at once. And if he did not go immediately to take the tongs or the broom and drive him out, for the whole idea was absolutely false and a doctrine an evil and unlawful thing. Despite their crusade to eradicate polygamy and excommunicate those who are practicing and promoting it, the crime and sin of polygamy was taking a stronghold upon the saints and rapidly infiltrating the restoration. Rumors that Joseph was secretly involved continued to increase. Joseph, Emma, and his brother Hiram intensified their efforts to eradicate the plural wife doctrine from the church. On October 5, 1843, Joseph gave instruction to try those who were preaching, teaching, or practicing this law stating, I forbid it and the practice thereof. No man shall have more than one wife. He and Hiram excommunicated men and women, published names of guilty persons in the paper, and answered countless letters from saints who asked if men having a certain priesthood could have as many wives as they chose. Joseph and Hiram's answer was firm. That man teaches false doctrine, for there is no such doctrine taught here. When polygamy rumors spread to include Hiram, Joseph and Emma directed the publication of the pamphlet, A Voice of Innocence. Their aim was to defend and exonerate Hiram while publicly denouncing the plural wife practice. The document was presented to several thousand saints who voted unanimously to raise our voices and hands against John C. Bennett's spiritual wife system as a grand scheme of profligates to seduce women. Let polygamy, bigamy, fornication, adultery, and prostitution be frowned out of the hearts of honest men to drop into the gulf of fallen nature and let all the saints say amen. LDS Church History and DNC Section 132 teach that there are times when God may command a man to enter into polygamy. Yet Joseph Smith consistently denied that he practiced plural marriage and spoke out against it, both publicly and privately. On April 8, 1844, co-president, co-prophet, and patriarch of the church, Hiram Smith, spoke at length against the plural wife system during a special meeting for the elders. He was decidedly against the idea in every form, calling it the damned foolish doctrine of polygamy. Hiram declared that God had never commanded any man to enter into plural marriage and promised that anyone discovered teaching, preaching, or living it would be called home, their preaching license removed, and their name published in the paper. A few weeks before his death, Joseph asked William Marks, president of the Nauvoo Stake Anti Council, to help bring leading men and women in high places to stand trial and be expelled for secretly practicing polygamy. Joseph stated that polygamy would ruin the church 
and lamented that he had been deceived by these men. Joseph was killed before he could follow through on bringing the guilty parties to trial. It is worth the effort to reconcile these contradictions. We live in a great day and age where truth long since hidden is coming forth into the light of day. The things of God are of deep import, taught Joseph, and time and experience and careful and ponders and solemn thoughts can only find them out. Thy mind, O man, if thou wilt lead a soul unto salvation, must stretch as high as the utmost heavens and search into and contemplate the darkest abyss and the broad expanse of eternity. Thou must commune with God. There is a growing movement within Mormonism to believe that Joseph meant it when he said the few weeks before he died, I had not been married scarcely five minutes and made one proclamation of the gospel before it was reported that I had seven wives. I find only one. I am the same man and as innocent as I was 14 years ago, and I can prove them all perjurers. Critics cry out that in the effort to exonerate Joseph and prove that he was a faithful monogamist, two main pieces of evidence are overlooked. LDS Doctrine and Covenants 132, known as the polygamy revelation, and the many testimonies of women who claim to have been married or sealed to Joseph. In June 1844, the first and only edition of the Nauvoo Expositor was published as an expose on Joseph and polygamy. It contained language similar in nature to what would become Doctrine and Covenants 132. Seriously concerned that the expositor would stir up angry mobs, the Nauvoo City Council consulted for two days to determine what action they should take, if any, against the paper. Testimony was given by both Joseph and Hiram concerning the purported polygamy revelation, which had been written down one year earlier on July 12, 1843, most likely in preparation for a sermon Joseph gave four days later, which he publicly taught the concepts of the revelation. Joseph testified before the city council on June 8th and 10th that the expositor transformed the truth of God into a lie, that he never preached the revelation in private as he had in public and had not taught polygamy to the anointed in the church, either in public or in private. Many men confirmed this statement. Joseph explained that he had been pondering on the passage in the Bible, in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven, and received for an answer that a man and his wife must be married in view of eternity in this life, or he will have no claim on her in the next. And that was the full amount of the revelation. Hiram testified that he read the marriage revelation to the High Council in August 1843 and that it was an answer to a question concerning things which transpired in former days and had no reference to the present time. Joseph's original marriage revelation is no longer in existence. Brigham Young and his followers claimed that Joseph Kingsbury, a store clerk, made a copy of the original revelation before Emma burned it. That copy was kept locked in Brigham's desk drawer until it was read for the first time in public during a special conference in Salt Lake City in 1852, eight years after Joseph's death. Many people who had seen or listened to the original testified that the one Brigham brought forth was nothing like the one Joseph had received. In 1876, Brigham had the law of the church on marriage which stated that one man should have but one wife, removed from the Doctrine and Covenants and replaced it with what is now known as Section 132. DNC 132 is an altered copy of a copy and has a dubious history. The second criticism regards believing the testimony of women misled by church leaders and husbands incorrect interpretations of Scripture false beliefs, and a wrong understanding of what Joseph was really teaching, 
many early Mormon women who agreed to plural marriage suffered terribly. Helen Mark Kimball, daughter of Heber and Violet, had lived 30 years in polygamy when she bemoaned, Nothing would induce me to lose that crown which awaits all that have laid their willing but bleeding hearts upon the altar. Sarah Pratt, first wife of Orson Pratt, left Mormonism when Orson, at age 57, took his 10th wife, a young girl of 16. Sarah called his venture into polygamy sheer fanaticism. Emmeline B. Wells, Daniel H. Wells' seventh wife, prominent writer and editor, defended plural marriage in public, but inwardly was full of sorrow. She recorded in her journal, Oh, if only my husband could only love me a little bit and not seem to be perfectly indifferent to, my sens to any sensation of that kind, he cannot know the cravings of my nature he is surrounded with love on every side, and I am cast out. How much sorrow I have known in place of the joy I look forward to. A daughter of Jedediah M. Grant said, Polygamy is all right when it is properly carried out on a shovel. <laughs> Brigham Young said the following about the struggles women had in polygamous unions. A few years ago, one of my wives, when talking about wives leaving their husbands, said, I wish my husband's wives would leave him, every soul of them, except myself. And that is the way they all feel, more or less, old and young. Phoebe Woodruff, first wife of Wilford Woodruff, shared with a close friend why she publicly supported polygamy. I loathe the unclean thing with all the strength of my nature. But sister, I have suffered all that a woman can endure. I am old and helpless and would rather stand up anywhere and say anything commanded of me than to be turned out of my home in my old age, which I should be most assuredly if I refused to obey counsel. Of all the testimonies women have given regarding Joseph and polygamy, there is one who holds the greatest value. She was the only woman whose life intertwined intimately with his. In all of scripture, there are only two women given the title elect lady by the Lord. Emma Smith was one of them. Despite the suspicion, turmoil, and poverty that accompanied Joseph from the beginning of the Restoration, Emma chose to unite her life with his. She was his greatest support and truest friend. Driven from state to state by persecution, the struggles to provide the necessities of life, the deaths of six children, caring for their family while Joseph was imprisoned or forced into hiding, what Emma experienced in her young married life would have emotionally and spiritually crippled most ordinary women. In fact, Joseph's mother Lucy said of her, I have never seen a woman in my life who would endure every species of fatigue and hardship from month to month and from year to year with that unflinching courage, zeal, and patience which she has ever done. For I know that which she has had to endure would have borne down almost any other woman. Emma suffered great sorrows and afflictions, yet she remained faithful and true to Joseph, to the Lord, and to the work of the Restoration. Those who advocated plural marriage in Nauvoo and later altered the LDS Church's history described Emma as a thorn in Joseph's side, opposing his plural marriage policies, burning the polygamy revelation, and leading him an ill life. According to Joseph, Emma, their children, and others who knew her, knew her these ac accusations were absolutely not true. Joseph and Emma had a respectful, loving, and affectionate marriage, asked if she and Joseph had ever quarreled or if she had opposed him where polygamy was concerned, Emma replied, 
I never had any reason to oppose him, for we were always on the best of terms ourselves. There was no necessity for any quarreling. He knew that I wished for nothing but what was right, and as he wished for nothing else, we did not disagree. But it was quite a grievous thing to many that I had any influence with him. Regarding DNC 132, Emma declared, the statement that I burned the original of the copy Brigham Young claimed to have is false and made out of pure fabrication and not true in any particular. I never saw anything purporting to be a revelation authorizing polygamy until I saw it in the seer published by Orson Pratt. Emma was considered of the purest and noblest intentions herself. She never submitted to be made a party to anything low, wrong, or evil, was absolutely fearless where the right was concerned. She was a woman of great compassion, honor, integrity, and truthfulness. If anyone knew what Joseph was about, it was Emma, who stood by his side as his partner, companion, and helpmeet. Emma stood shoulder to shoulder with Joseph to fight iniquity and consistently championed him as a man of honor and virtue. Toward the end of her life, she said of him, Joseph did not have improper relations with any woman that ever came to my knowledge. She spoke so endearingly of Joseph with confidence, tears filling her eyes that you could see she reverenced his very memory and had full faith in Joseph's inspiration as a prophet of God and she always denied in the most emphatic language that he taught or practiced polygamy. Joseph assured Emma that if she heard rumors about spiritual marriages or anything of the kind, that they were without foundation, there was no such doctrine and never should be with his knowledge or consent. She recalled that Joseph told her polygamy was contrary to the will of heaven and always led to violence. Emma, who knew Joseph best, was firm. He had no other wife or wives other than myself in any sense, either spiritual or otherwise. After Joseph's death, the restoration shattered into dozens of offshoots and began to fall into ruin and decay. Polygamy entered Brigham's branch unchecked and proceeded to destroy lives and shatter faiths. Since God's definition of adultery includes sexual relations outside the bounds of a monogamous marriage, if we are going to rescue, preserve, and live the restoration begun by Joseph, we ought to know what that entails, including the truth behind polygamy. Joseph was one of this world's greatest Christian thinkers. He laid a foundation that would revolutionize the whole world. His audacious and unorthodox religion was a gift from God intended for all mankind. Yet God's voice through Joseph has largely been silenced by the stain of polygamy. Honest seekers for truth disregard and discount Joseph's marvelous message in part because they believe he was a liar, a hypocrite, a sexual deviant, and a pedophile. Opposing information preserves our right to choose. On one side are the testimonies of known liars, traitors, and enemies of Joseph, the men and women who embrace the damned foolish doctrine of polygamy, placing the blame of their own sins upon the shoulders of Joseph and the LDS Church's long-standing historical traditions. On the other side, are the testimony of Joseph, a prophet of God, who declared a few weeks before his death, it is our purpose to build up and establish the principles of righteousness and not to break down and destroy. The great Jehovah has ever been with me and the wisdom of God will direct me in the seventh hour. I feel in closer communion and better standing with God than ever I felt before in my life and the testimony of Emma, his elect lady, who lamented that the Utah Mormons had by their acts since the death of her husband made true all the slanders and vile things charged against the church. Either Joseph and Emma were telling the truth 
or they were not. John C. Bennett's lies and Brigham Young's doctrine of polygamy have stained the restoration long enough. The Lord promised Joseph, your people shall never be turned against you by the testimony of traitors. You shall be had in honor and but for a small moment and your voice shall be more terrible in the midst of your enemies than the fierce lion because of your righteousness and your God shall stand by you forever and ever. I invite you to come to know the correct character, perfections, and attributes of the Lord through the revelations, teachings, and writings of Joseph Smith. Together, we can rescue the restoration and help move it toward its glorious prophesied conclusion. I say this in Jesus' name, amen.